Yo, what is going on guys? Just a quick one. This is going to be an eight part series. Uh, so it's going to be eight videos, roughly 10 minutes long. I will be uploading them daily until the whole interview is complete. So make sure you are subscribed with bell notifications turned on so you don't miss a video. Our conversation is with Mr. Yuri Alexandrovich Bezmianov. Mr. Bezmianov was born in 1939 in a suburb of Moscow. He was the son of a high-ranking Soviet Army officer. He was educated in the elite schools inside the Soviet Union and became an expert in Indian culture and Indian languages. He had an outstanding career with Novosti, which was the, and still is, I should say, the press arm or the press agency of the Soviet Union. It turns out that this is also a front for the KGB. One of his interesting assignments was to brainwash foreign diplomats when they visited Moscow and he'll tell us a little bit about how they did this and how they planted information which eventually wound up in the press of the free world. He escaped to the West in 1970 after becoming totally disgusted with the Soviet system and he did this at great risk to his life. He certainly is one of the world's outstanding experts on the subject of Soviet propaganda and disinformation and active measures. Mr. Bezmianov, I'd like to begin by having you tell us a little bit about some of your childhood memories. Well, the most vivid memory of my childhood was Second World War, or to be more precise, the end of the Second World War, when all of a sudden, United States, from a friendly uh, nation, which helped us to defeat Nazism, turned overnight into a, a deadly enemy. And it was very shocking because uh, all newspapers were trying to present an image of belligerent, aggressive American imperialism. Most of the things that we were taught is that the United States is aggressive power, which is just about to invade our beautiful, free, socialist country, uh, that American CIA is dropping Colorado beetles on our beautiful potato fields to eliminate our crops. And each schoolboy had a, a picture of Colorado bug on the, on the back page of his notebook. And we were instructed to go into collective fields to search for those little Colorado bugs. Of course, we couldn't find any. Neither we could find ma many potatoes. And that was explained again by the encroachments of the decadent imperialist power. Um, the anti-American paranoia, hysteria in, in the Soviet propaganda w was to such an, uh, of such a higher degree uh, that many less skeptical people or less stubborn would really believe that the United States is just about to invade our beautiful motherland and some secretly hope that it will come true. That's interesting. Yes. Well, getting back to uh, life inside the Soviet Union or inside communist countries in general, in this country, uh, at the university level primarily, we read and hear that uh, the Soviet system is different from ours, but not that different, and that there is a convergence uh, developing between all of the systems of the world, and that really it doesn't make an awful lot of difference what system you live under, because you have corruption and dishonesty and tyranny and all that sort of thing. From your personal experience, what is the difference between life under communism and life in the United States? Well, life is obviously very much different for, for simple reason that uh, the Soviet Union is a state capitalist economically. It's a state capitalism where an individual has absolutely no rights, no value. His life is nothing. It's just like an insect. He's disposable. Whereby in the United States, even the, the, even the worst criminal is treated as a human being. He has a fair trial. And some of them capitalize on their crimes. They, they publish their memoirs in their prisons and uh, get handsomely paid by your crazy publishers. Uh, the uh, differences, of course, in the daily life are very various, uh, depending on who whom we are talking about. In my own private life, I never suffered from communism, simply because I was brought up in a family of high-ranking military officer. Uh, most of the doors were open for me. Most of my expenses were paid by the government, and I never had any troubles in, uh, with the authorities or, or with the police. So, in other words, I, I would say I, I enjoyed, or I had good reasons to enjoy, all the advantages of so-called socialist uh, system. Mm -hmm. My main uh, motivations to defect was, had nothing to do with affluence. It was mainly moral 
indignation, moral protest, rebellion against the inhuman methods of, of the Soviet system. Well, specifically, what did you object to? I objected, first of all, against oppression of my own dissidents and intellectuals. And that was the most disgusting thing that, that I witnessed as a, as a young man, young student, who was brought up uh, at a very troublesome period in our history, from Stalin to Khrushchev, from total tyranny and oppression to some kind of liberalization. Second, when I started working for the Soviet embassy in India, I, to my horror, I discovered that we are millions times more oppressive than any colonial or imperialist power in the history of mankind, that my country brings to India not freedom, progress, and, and friendship between the nations, but uh, racism, exploitation, and slavery, and, and, and of course economical inefficiency to this country. Since I fell in love with India, uh, I developed something which by KGB standards is an extremely dangerous thing. It's called split loyalty when an agent likes a country of assignment more than his own country. I literally fell in love with this beautiful country, a country of great contrasts, but also great humility, great tolerance, and, and if philosophical and intellectual freedoms. My ancestors used to live in caves and eat raw meat when India was a highly civilized nation 6,000 years ago. So obviously the choice was not to the advantage of my own nation. I decided to defect and to entirely dissociate myself from that brutal regime. Mr. Besmianov, uh, we've read a lot about the concentration camps and the slave labor camps under the Stalin regime. Now the general impression in America is that those things are part of the past. Are they still going on today, or what is the yes. status? Yes. There is no qualitative change in, in the Soviet concentration camp system. Uh, there are changes in, in numbers of prisoners. Again, this is uh, un unreliable Soviet statistics. We don't know how many political prisoners are there in the Soviet concentration camps. But we sure know from, from various sources that at each uh, particular time there are close to uh, 25 to 30 million of Soviet citizens who are virtually kept as slaves in forced labor camp system size of the uh, population of a uh, ca country like Canada is serving terms as, as prisoners. Incredible. So um, I would say that those intellectuals who try to convince American public that concentration camp system is a thing of a past are either conscientiously misleading public opinion or they are not in very intellectual people. They, they are selectively blind. They, don't, they lack um, intellectual honesty when they say that. Well, we've spoken about the intellectuals in this country and also the intellectuals in the Soviet Union. What about down at the broad mass level? Do the people in general, the, worker, the working people, the workers in general in the Soviet Union, do they support the system? Do they tolerate it? What is their attitude? Well, average Soviet citizen, if there is such an animal, of course, does not like the system because it hurts, it kills. He may not understand the, the reasons, he, he may not have enough information or, or educational background to understand, uh, but I doubt very much there are many people who are uh, conscientiously supporting the Soviet system. There are not such such people in USSR. Even those who have all the reasons to enjoy socialism, people like myself, who were a member of journalistic elite, uh, they, they also hate the system for, for different reasons though, not because they lack material affluence, but because they are unfree to think, they are in constant fear, duplicity, split personality, and this is the greatest tragedy for my nation. Well, what do you think are the chances of the people actually overcoming their system or replacing it? Uh, there is a great possibility that system will sooner or later be, be destroyed from within. There is a self-destructive mechanism built in, into any socialist or communist or fascist system uh, because there is lack of feedback, because the system does not 
rely upon loyalty of, of population. But until, and until this Soviet junta is being supported by the Western so-called imperialists, that is, multinational companies, establishments, governments, um, and let's face it, uh, intellectuals, so-called academia in the United States is famous for supporting the Soviet system. Uh, as long as the Soviet junta will keep on receiving credits, money, technology, grain deals, and political recognition from all these traitors of democracy or freedom, uh, there is no hope, there is not much hope for, for changes in my country, and the system will not collapse by itself simply because it's, it's being nourished by so-called American imperialism. This is the greatest paradox in history of mankind when uh, capitalist world supports and actively nourishes its own destru destroyer, destructor. I think you're trying to tell us something. Oh yes. Okay.